Now it's good to be with you and to share again the truth of God from 1 Corinthians. I need to apologise this running through 1 Corinthians chapter 6 may be a little bit disjointed at the moment because some of it was recorded in the past. This particular one is being recorded just now, uh, which is in 2020. And uh, I'm just trying to fill in some of the gaps. And of course, uh, it's not good to go through a passage and to miss out sections. So that's why I'm doing it uh, this way. I'm not quite sure what happened to that recording in the past. So you forgive me uh, for that if if it seems a little disjointed. We're going to deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and from verse 9 to 11 today. So let me read it with you. It says this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit... The, sorry. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, and you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now I misread the first part of verse 9, and isn't it important just to remember how you can just leave out a word and it can change the meaning of a verse completely. This verse says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, this is a very sad verse in many ways. And yet I'm so glad that when you come to verse number 11, it says, But such were some of you. He's not saying that people in these categories cannot be saved, but it's saying that people whose lifestyle is being consistently and still is in those categories of behaviour, they are not saved people. If they are people who are still fornicating, worshipping idols, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, and the list is quite an awful list. Now, we've learned in chapter 5 that Christians have not to live isolated from the world. Chapter 5, of course, is about sin in the life of a believer and how a local church handles it. And what we learn in chapter 5 is you cannot but avoid rub shoulders with people in the categories of sins that we have described to us in the verses I've just read. So this is not teaching that a Christian never meets these people. In fact, we will meet them and not necessarily even be aware that they're practicing some of these things because a lot of these sins are hidden, done behind closed doors and are not seen and obvious. But what we are learning from chapter 5 is a Christian should never be like that. And if they are, then Christians, other Christians have to dissociate themselves so that they will repent and so that they might know God's forgiveness. What we're learning in chapter 5 is you cannot live outside of uh, rubbing shoulders with and mixing with people with all difficulty, sinful practices and backgrounds. But what we're learning in chapter 6 is those people will not be in and are not in the kingdom of heaven. This is something that we need to really, the kingdom of God, should I say, from this passage. Both are the same with different aspects, but that's a discussion for another day. So I would put over this section, verses 9 to 11, remember your past and think about the grace of of God. We, we'll come to that just in a moment, but of course we know that in this section he's been dealing with uh, whether a Christian should take another Christian to court, to sue or not to sue, you might say, verses 1 to 8. Well, we have, uh, we, we are dealing with this section just now about people. I've actually put over another heading there, the candidates for parliament, because if you think about it, in the first section he's taught us that we're going to rule the world one day. In this section he's saying, but Bear in mind the people who are in the kingdom and the people who will rule are not the people who practice sin, but the people who once practice sin and they're washed, they're clean, they're saved. That's the emphasis of this section, which is beautiful. So the candidates for parliament, though I've given it that other title, remember your past and the grace of God. And then when we come to the final section, it's about living for God today, glorifying God in your bodies. So he's he's talked about people who they are depending on to pass judgment on differences of opinion within the church. And he said, no, no, don't go to them. Remember, you're going to judge the world and therefore you should be able to sort these matters out. So he says, remember that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes through that list. 
And he says, they are not the people who are going to come into the good of the blessings. Now, if we were to work our way through the idea of inheritance, we'd be here for a long time. For it's a tremendous truth of the Christian as a joint heir with Christ. We have an inheritance in Christ and we are the inheritance of Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And these truths will be explained in other passages of Scripture. And we're fellow heirs with our fellow believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. So much truth in there. But those who live and practice sin and have never been converted, they will not inherit, come into the good of God's kingdom. But you will. And that's why I want you to think about verse 11 as we as we come towards the end of this little teaching slot. And such were some of you. Isn't it amazing that people are saved from the worst categories of society? God is not selecting what you might call the best. But God loves everyone. I was reading Jonah this morning. I was reading about God telling Jonah off about his reaction to the salvation of the people of Nineveh. And you know, Jonah got so upset when the gourd grew up quickly and died overnight. What is it that God says to Jonah whenever he reminds him about the value of those people? I'm going to test my skills here as to how quickly I can find Jonah in the Old Testament. And that's it. It's not doing well, am I? Well, you come to chapter four of Jonah and he says to, to Jonah, should I not spare Nineveh? He says, you'd pity on the gourd for which thou hast not laboured, neither made it grow. He's saying you put no effort into that plant and yet you were angry about its destruction. I think the point is God has put effort into people's lives and God develops them and God loves them and God values them. So God says about these people in Corinth, you were like this, but you're washed. All oh, the gospel cleanses a person's life. You're washed. God has dealt with your sin, but you're also sanctified. And you sanctified is, is, is more than just washed. It's you've been made holy. It's that you've been blessed with something. It's not just the removal of something, but it's it's the moral idea, the other side of justification and righteousness. Justification is to impute, to credit to your account a right standing with God. Sanctification is to make you holy. Here's an amazing thing. You're washed by the blood of Christ. You're sanctified and you're justified. So he uses all these expressions. You've been credited with a right standing before God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the authority. It's the power. It's the reason it's possible because of his work and because of all that he has done. And by the spirit of our God, that's the power and the virtue and the authority. The spirit of God is the one who brings that about in our life. This is a tremendous little section. Remember your past. Remember the grace of God. And God has fitted you to be candidates for his parliament, to rule with Christ and to live in a future day, enjoy all his blessings. So let that affect how you live and handle circumstances today. Trust God will bless his word to us.